the age of information overload, apparently we humans still have a need to gather, ponder, comment, debate, and hang out together over coffee and cozy venues. The Philosopher's Cafe series in Vancouver continues to rock and roll in spite of texting and tweeting and email and all the other ways of connecting in cyberspace. Roman Onofrichuk is a lecturer in communications at Simon Fraser University. He's been a moderator of the Philosopher's Cafe sessions since it began in Vancouver. It is my pleasure to welcome Roman Onofrichuk to Studio 4 to tell us more. Hi. Hi, Roman. What more do you need to know? That's it. <laughs> That's it. Goodbye. That's it. Thank you. That was a great interview. <laughs> Wasn't it? Painless. Don't you like the way I ask questions? <laughs> mm -hmm. So the question we posited in the beginning was, why would somebody who teaches all day want to do something like moderate in the night? Talk, 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 more, 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 learn, well, absorb. You know, when you teach, uh, what you have to do is you have, you have to talk. That's exactly right. But when you moderate, you don't talk so much. You actually encourage uh, mm -hmm. the other people to talk. And the bulk of the talking that I end up doing is occasionally offering uh, alternative insight or perhaps challenging somebody's view. But generally speaking, uh, it's really easy work. All I do is just mm. keep them moving, you know. Usually they're, they're pretty active anyway, so it's sure. not that hard. And you must learn a lot from the questions people ask. Let's go back to the beginning of uh, Philosopher's Cafe. Sure. Where did it begin? Well, the original one begins in Paris, actually, with a guy by the name of Marc Sauté, who was a, a, a trained philosopher, had a PhD in philosophy, and uh, decided that uh, the public needed a chance to talk about serious matters. Mm -hmm. And he started up a cafe at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning. And, you know, it started small, 10, 15 people, and then university students started to come, and then all kinds of people started to come. And it used to get to the point we'd have 200 people out for one of these 11 o'clock in the morning sessions. But the cafe as such, a cafe, has been a kind of a homeland for the, you know, the what, uh, people who don't feel like they fit in or people who want to make mm. a revolution since, mm -hmm. since it began. And that goes back to the 1500s. The first real philosopher's cafe actually originates in 1686, Cafe Procope again in Paris. Really? Mm -hmm. well, uh, what's the difference between a cafe and a salon? Oh, well, a salon is in a private home. Okay. And it's by invitation. I see. A cafe is a commercial venture in which the door is open. Anybody can come in. Now, I'm sure there's many people who think, I'm just not smart enough uh, to go to one of those philosophers' cafe. I'm not an intellect. I can maybe talk about Chris Christopherson uh, when he wrote, Freedom is just another word with nothing left to lose. Yeah, yeah. But I doubt I can debate whether anarchy is right or wrong. Well, you know... <laughs> If, if you think of philosophy as a uh, professional field where you've got to read Immanuel Kant and you've got to read Heidegger and you've got to read right. these guys and those guys, but philosophy is actually an inquiry into the nature of life. And we all, we all live the human condition. We all meet up with uh, power. We all meet up with uh, unhappiness. We all meet up with uh, insufficient this and inadequate that. And as a result, everybody can be quite sure. philosophical. It's just a matter of dealing with what is it that grinds mm -hmm. us, what is it that turns us on, what, it, what makes us excited. And uh, it's about ideas and great ideas. Uh, yeah, and it's not about showing off who you've read. You know, it's more right. about what you think. Sure, I get that. And if we can teach kids to think, the future will be better. I think it was Mortimer Adler who said that to me once, he, who wrote, when he wrote, was it Six Great Ideas or mm -hmm. something like that? He said that our goal in education should be to teach kids how to think. Uh, and education yeah. is emancipation. You wrote that. Yeah, it, it, well, it is emancipation. It, it, and and the, the challenge to think critically kind of gets knocked out of us, unfortunately, in the educational system. You know, I, I had a prof years ago when I was an undergraduate. He used to tell a story about uh, sea turtles. You know, they, they struggled on the way up on the beach, and they lay whatever, 200 eggs, and they go back in the sea. And then, however many months later, all these little turtles hatch, and they all scramble down the, the, uh, down the coast to the water. And before they get to the water, the birds pick off about half of them. And right. when they get into the water, little fish, uh, bigger than the little turtles, go after them. And then the ones who survive get into the deeper water, and the bigger fish go after them. And so out of those 200 eggs, maybe five survive. And this particular professor used to always say, and that's what happens to creativity in the educational system. Mm. Because, I mean, I've had the experience where I've taught courses where you get them to write an introductory essay before they've read anything. And then they write an essay at the end, 
And the surprising thing is that the material at the end is never as energetic or as genuine and authentic as it is the beginning because they get so buried in readings. Now, now they want to show mm. that they've read the books and they can use the okay. vocabulary, you know? And the energy which comes from the actual experience of the world, what you see, what you sense, what you actually feel, gets knocked away by citing the books, citing the material. So it's a real struggle sure. to, to introduce people to the, re to the literature and to keep them energetic and alive mm. and intellectually vital. I understand that because when you're not prepared and someone asks you to stand up and, and give a speech on something, you draw from your very soul, mm -hmm. really. Well, yeah. And you just start to uh, talk and hope you're right. When you prepare, often your speeches are, are probably not as good. I don't know that for sure, but perhaps. Well, uh, I mean, the, the line of work you do, you know, you, you interview people every day, you ask questions. Sometimes your guests are interesting, sometimes. I've done I, well. I've done your kind of job, and sometimes they're logs. You know, they sit there and they look really nice, and they don't say a thing that you want to hear. Mm. And you got to keep on poking them, and it's like, oh God, I got to go to yeah. ten minutes with this person. Mm. What am I going to do? It, I know. I, I've been there. So have you. Well, you started in the radio biz, right? Yeah. Take me back. Yeah, radio originally. Well, actually, originally television, then radio, and then from radio, 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 and then I tossed it all over, decided one day I couldn't take another three-minute item. It would right. kill me. Not Thank another you. mindless sound bite, you mean? You got it. <laughs> uh, so I went to university and discovered I liked it and discovered that it uh, that it gave me a sense of fulfillment and I love the information so I just kept at it until I finished my PhD. And you did your PhD on McLuhan? Ah, uh, yeah. And Harold Innes or well, how did that work? Well, it worked like this. My, my senior supervisor, Dr. William Leese, very bright man, told me that I couldn't do both, you know? Right. Because it's too big and it, it was mm -hmm. too big. So I did the clever thing. I, if I had done Innes, I couldn't have done McLuhan but you can't do McLuhan without doing Innes. Okay, who was Innes? Innes was a Canadian political economist who uh, was born in 1894 and died in 1952, a relatively young man. Uh, cancer took him. And uh, he spent most of his life trying to understand how staples operate. In other words, how the most important economic product in a society generates mm -hmm. the kind of social formations that it generates. And he kept on going one step backwards. So he started out with, uh, he started out with the railways and he went back to the fur trade in the cod fishery, and throughout all this, he's asking himself, what is the most fundamental staple? And the most fundamental staple is knowledge. So how do you get that staple mm. out? Media of communication. So he actually founded the study of communication and media. Now, McLuhan was a literary critic yeah. who, as a young graduate, just with a new, his new PhD, Innes put McLuhan's book on Innes's own graduate course reading list. They met once. McLuhan got completely boggled, wrote, read one of Innes's books, wrote him this long letter which, in which he basically outlined his entire life's work. And Innes died. I don't think it was because of the letter. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but there was no response uh, right. because Innes was in the last stages of, of cancer. And McLuhan uh, combined rhetoric, the study of rhetoric and language, with the study of electronic media. So what he basically did was he took rhetoric out of its old framework of language and moved it to cameras and lights and all of this. Yeah, how fascinating. Yeah, truly. A, a topic another day for us. But uh, let's go to the Philosopher's Cafe. Yeah. Uh, uh, Joseph Wask yeah. uh, founded it here in Vancouver. Brilliant man. Indeed. What happens at a Philosopher's Cafe? Okay, well, uh, I think every, every one of my colleagues does it slightly differently, but there's kind of a general pattern in which we uh, establish topics usually about four months before the event. So, for example, my topics for the late spring are what I'm thinking about right now, okay. for example. But uh, when people arrive, uh, basically I do a, a short monologue, if you want to call it that, lasts usually no more than five minutes, in which I set up the question. So I set up what, what some of the dynamics are around okay. the question. And then I open it to the floor. Uh, you can tell I come from broadcasting. I still think in those kind of open it to the floor mm -hmm. terms. But anyway, you just open it up, and uh, usually somebody will jump in, and away it'll go. And, and do they fight? Uh, uh, debate? What's the right word? No fisticuffs or no, anything. No, no, it's no, very no. Uh, philosophical, is it? No, or no, does no, it get it, heated? It can, and get, it can get pretty passionate. Yeah, it can get pretty passionate. Uh, my job is to keep the fisticuffs down. 
and to keep it flowing sure. rationally and intelligently. As, as I think I said in one interview, I'm, I'm all for opinion. I love opinion. Mm -hmm. But reason and tolerance and intelligence are absolute necessities. You've sure. got to listen to people, hear them out. And the questions are things we know often. Should all children be taught music? Yeah. It's an opinion. Yeah. Yay, nay. Uh, when is the cost of winning too high? Yeah. What makes a good teacher? Mm. Uh, what, what are we to make of the new sort of right-wing swing in, in uh, world politics? Oh, in Europe and the USA. Absolutely. Uh, the neocons. Neo, never mind the neocons, the neo-fascists. The neo-fascists. That neo -fascists. are being fascists. elected in Europe, some mm. countries. What's it about? Where does it come from? Why is it here? Right. Uh, how can we stop it or should we stop it? All and, of that? And what are, what are the parameters and the limits of freedom? Right. You know, like, if, if I have free speech, does that mean I can say mm. anything at any time? We did, one quite, we did one discussion on uh, does knowing the truth legitimize speaking it? Like if you know the truth, are you therefore forced or legitimated to always say to it? To always say it. Even if you hurt forth. people. Even if you hurt people mm -hmm. in the process, right? That, I remember going back to the little white lie. Mm. Or it was called, my father called it selective truth telling. Ah, uh, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. How nice to meet you. Pleasure. Come back, we'll talk more. I look forward to it. Okay. The Philosopher's Cafe, uh, uh, Metro Vancouver locations near you. Uh, Roman sessions are in False Creek, first Thursday of every month.